All right, there we go. So the uh, I'm going to sweeten the deal on that. Going to these Linux workshops, there's also a um, a presentation. I'm trying to get used to this new website here. There we go. There will be a presentation on Friday as well by our TA, Jaron Willis. And he is um, he's finishing up his master's degree on, um, on Friday. He's going to present on his project that he worked on. And uh, you're all welcome to attend that. And if you do, I'm going to take attendance. And if you <coughs> attend, I'll give 15 points of uh, extra credit for attending this, attending this uh, presentation by Jaron. And, uh, and also, you don't have to attend this, but while you're on campus and it's around the same time, you can also participate in a Linux workshop. It's a great opportunity, really going to pick up a lot of knowledge that way. And I, I think his, his topic is going to be interesting. He, he wrote a mobile <coughs> game. So he's, he's vying to get into the, the video game business. And he's interviewing for jobs right now. And one of the, the project that he worked on was to make a mobile app. And a mobile game. So he's going to present on that. So you're welcome to uh, attend that 15 points extra credit. All right. <clears throat> now let's. Uh, I'm going to cover cover these question. I'm going to cover the um, exam two answers. That's the first thing I'm going to do, and then I'm going to move on to. Um, uh, <clears throat> talk about arrays with uh, any time that we have left over. All right, so here it is. Now here's the first problem, bean jar. There's two classes on the exam. One is the bean jar class. The other was the, I forget what it's called, number class, I think. And there's a description of how the class functions here. And uh, draw the UML diagram. That's the first, uh, first thing that we need to do. And let me put that up for you. Most people got this, but so I'll just do it anyway. I'll try to do it quickly. So we've got three sections in the UML diagram. And um, one section is the, um, the name of the class. That's the top section. And... Um, So I'll put the class name in the top section. It's called bean jar. And the second section are the member variables. And we start those member variables with a plus or a minus sign, depending on whether they're public or private. And in this class, all of the member variables, which are here, are private. They're in this section that's labeled private. You can have member variables that are public, and you can have functions that are private as well, but we just didn't do that. So max beans and beans. So we write the name of the, uh, the variable, max beans, and then we give its data type. It's an int. And then the next one is beans. And now there is a, um, the third section lists the functions, the member functions of the class. And there are four functions, as you can see. There's the constructor. The constructor is always the same name as the class. And um, most languages do it like that, not all languages. You can click through that. So the bean jar constructor takes, um, uh, I think it's first is the max beans. That's the first argument. And the second argument is the number of beans in the jar. That's also an int. There's no return type for constructors. You don't declare them as void or anything. Oh, but we do want to list that it's public. So we'll put a plus sign in front of that function. That means it's public. And the next uh, function we'll list is uh, getBeans. 
Now get beans takes no arguments and it returns an integer. Now notice I didn't put const in there. If you want to put const in there, you can do that. I mean that's fine. You can do that if you want. Someone, one or two people did that. I think and that's all, that's okay. Extra information is all right. Also in practice, you can reduce the amount of information if you want to summarize the the class with less information. Maybe <coughs> omit the arguments or omit the data types. Those are all variants, but we didn't. You know, for the exam, I wanted this sort of strict amount of detail provided, although some of you did provide a summary of, um, of the information that, uh, that I was expecting. So get beans returns uh, an int, and then add beans takes number of beans. You can see, like, add beans is a function that takes an integer argument, named beans here, although the name is arbitrary. But it helps to pick a good name for, for readability purposes. And it returns a Boolean value, whether this function succeeded or not. So add beans uh, takes an integer argument called beans, which is an int. And the whole function returns a bool. And that's how that looks. And I added a function which I didn't cover called remove all beans. There it is. I never used this before in my, you know, I use this example a lot in the courses that I, I've taught in the past. And this was a new function I decided to add in there. It takes no arguments. Just take what, however many beans are in the jar, just remove them all. And this, uh, this kind of fooled people, it's a void function, so I don't have to return anything here. It fooled people because I think it was too simple. What do you do? You just set beans to zero. That's it. It's a one-liner, and not much of a line for that. So um, that's the UML class diagram right there. Let's take a look at the uh, bean jar constructor. Bean jar. The bean, gar, the bean jar constructor runs after the system allocates sets aside memory to store an instance of the class. <coughs> it's the constructor's job to initialize that memory. And the memory is comprised of two uh, pieces of, of primitive data, the max beans and beans. Max beans equals max yeah, I got beans. that wrong. Yeah, <laughs> fix that. I will fix that. This should be max beans. Thank you. That's enough to answer that question right there. See? So when the, this, you can think of it as this identifies that storage that's been allocated for the object. That storage, which is going to be used to represent the maximum number of beans that the jar can handle. And so we take the, the max beans value that's being passed into the function and assign it into that storage location. That's, that's how you can think about it. I'm giving you one sort of mental model that you can apply to understand what's going on here. Same thing for beans. So what about the get beans function? Let's implement that. <clears throat> now get beans, look, get beans returns an int. So we need to have a return statement. See the the uh, the constructor doesn't have a return statement. I mean it could, but it would it would just be return but um, without any argument to it. <clears throat> but this uh, function here uh, has to return an integer, so we need to have a return statement in there. And what is it going to return? It's, it's straightforward. Just return the number of beans that are in the jar. That's it. Now, you could say this beans, but we don't have to because there's no 
in that function here, this get beans function that looks like this, there's no argument. There's no uh, there are no arguments. So this the only variables that are visible to the function would be global variables, which we don't work with. It would be in this case only the member variables, max beans and beans. Those are visible inside the function. When we implement the function, we can refer to max beans and beans. And we can refer to those unambiguously because there's no other variables called by those names that, that are within scope of this function get beans. That's different. The constructor is different because the constructor has these function arguments named max beans and beans. So we have a naming conflict. They have the same names as the names of, of the member functions. So we need to distinguish between the two. That's why we use this there. And we could use this here as well, but it wouldn't be necessary. I don't know if people get that. It takes a while to say. I keep repeating myself because I, it takes a while for this stuff to sink in. So I do a lots of repeating uh, of what I, what I say, which is natural for a person getting old like me as well. You know, it's like repeating yourself. Anyway. <clears throat> so uh, what about uh, number four? Provide an implementation of the remove all beans function. And uh, this one is really easy. It's just beans equals zero. That's it. You don't have to do any testing. That's how you remove all the beans. How, would, how do you represent an empty jar of beans? Well, the number of beans in the jar would have to be zero. That's how you represent an empty jar. Notice we're not modifying the capacity of the jar. It, the, the, quest, the function doesn't modify the capacity of a jar, but it removes the beans. It modifies the value that represents how many beans are in there, consuming that capacity. So <clears throat> what about add beans? This is the hardest one, add beans. And like add beans takes the number of beans to add. And there we have a naming conflict. The, the function argument beans is the same as the member variable beans. And the naming conflict is there on purpose because it suggests that, oh, this is, those are things are, are similar, not identical. Well, in the constructor, they're identical. You know, what's passed in as beans is simply copied into the beans variable. Here, what's passed in as beans has to be added to the beans variable. So then the, the naming conflict was intentional because it's, it's, all, it's like good documentation. It makes the code more readable. Well, some might disagree with that, and those people would choose a different name in that case. You could call that beans to add or just B. So, you know, that, that would be debatable, you know, whether this is more readable with a naming conflict or less readable. I think that would be, that would come down to a matter of opinion. Anyway, let's implement the function add beans. So we don't want to, the, the function is going to return false if it can't add the number of beans being requested. So we've got to check that. So if the number of beans that are, are, are being requested to add to the jar, if that plus how many beans are currently in the jar, if that results in a value that's bigger than max beans, then we're going to return false. We can't do it. Oops, I'm going to change that name. So if the beans that are being that that we need to add, that's beans, plus the beans that are in the jar, this beans. Those two things added together gives a number that's bigger than max beans. We can't do it. It would create um, an inconsistency in the data. Right? We can't have a jar that has more beans than its capacity. So there we return false. Otherwise, we can add them in there. So this beans, that's the, that's the variable that stores the number of beans in the jar, plus equal beans. 
And that's it. Oh, of course, we need to return true as well. And I spelled that wrong again. That's one way to write it. Maybe that's hard to read, so I'm going to change. I'll, I'll fix that. Or I'll, I'll modify it. So let's use, uh, let's use this approach. We'll make it an, an if-else statement. Maybe this is easier to read. That's just, that's the same thing. Okay. What about the next problem? The integer class. There it is. It wasn't numbers. It's called integer. You forgot the test code. What's that? You skipped the test code question. Oh, the test code. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let's test. Develop test code to test add beans. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right by that. Didn't even see it. Okay. So we want to test this bean jar class. We want to test the add beans function rather. So we need an instance of the class. That's the first thing you gotta do in the test code. You've got to create an instance of the bean jar class. So I'm gonna call it bean jar b and capacity of ten beans with two beans initially in there. Okay. So now we have a bean jar called bean, a uh, b rather, and um, or maybe it's I'll call it I'll call it jar. There we go. Maybe that's more readable. It's a variable, so we want to. It's up to us what we want to use for those variable names. So we create an instance of bean jar. We call it jar. It has a capacity of ten. Initially, it has two beans in it. So. <coughs> Let's um, let's let's add. So we have, um, and we're going to use these assert statements on this jar. If we try to add beans three, that should be true. That should return true. And also, if we do get beans, that should be five. So that checks to see that um, that add beans accepted the three, turning true, and then modified the total number of beans in the jar correctly, so we get five. And um, <coughs> Now let's try to add uh, seven beans. Well, we have five beans in there already, so we can't add seven beans because there's only room for five more. So if we call add beans with seven, that should return a false. And the total number of beans in the jar remains unchanged. That's according to the description of the class, which is given here. All right, so that this right up here describes how the functions work. And we could have a different description of those functions. And we would have to provide a different implementation. Yeah. So in this problem, we're using get the function dot get beans to get the total amount of beans in the jar, right? Yeah. Is that what I called it? Yeah. Yeah, get beans, get right? Beans. So how come in problem four, why don't we return get beans as zero instead of just beans? Here? Yeah. Oh, remove all beans. Remove all remove all beans is a void function, so we don't return anything. We're not returning anything. We're not getting information. And notice get beans is a constant function. We're just reading the state of the object. How many beans do you have? So that's constant. We're not modifying the state of the object. Right? Remove all beans is not declared as const because it modifies the object. It changes what's stored in that, that internal variable called beans. So it's, it's like we're simulating that all the beans have been removed. We just set the variable to zero. That's, a, that's how we simulate the removal of all the beans in the jar. And we're not returning anything. It's a do, it's a do this operation. Just do it. How about that was just setting 
get beans to zero, not return them to zero. No, we don't set get beans. You can't set. That's a function. Get beans is not settable. It's a function. You can't set a function. You can set a variable. You can set, you know, this beans to zero. You can't. You can't set a function to zero. But actually, you can though, because functions are. Well, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> All right. So, is that clear? I know it's not clear. I know this is fuzzy. That's why I repeat myself over and over again, and I'm not expecting everybody to, you know, get this right away. It just takes a long time to sink in. But this is how it's done in practice, not just in this language, practically every language, every computer language. So if you want to do any coding at all in your life, you got to know how to do what I'm showing you today, for sure. And it takes a while, so don't, don't be discouraged if you don't get it now. But don't be lazy. you got to keep at it. you got to practice. Do a lot of coding. You do coding mixed with some reading. More coding than reading. you got to do a lot of coding. Just go for it. Just do lots of tinkering. And uh, make hypotheses and try things out. And then do a little reading, you know, listening, videos, whatever. And uh, that's how you get it. But if you don't do any coding... Then uh, it's going to be very tough to get this. All right. Uh, what about integer now? This is this integer class has two public functions: the constructor, which takes an integer n, and uh, then it has a function called is prime. So it, is prime returns true or false? Is the value that this object represents is, is the is that number is that integer value a prime number or not? So it's going to return true or false. It's a read-only function. That's why it's, just, it's declared as const. Here. And when you call is prime, it doesn't modify what the integer object represents. It's just like a read-only function. Just tell me yes or no whether you're it's a prime or not. And then here's the variable that. We only have one variable that we store the information in. It's just the value that we're representing. So an instance of the integer class sort of represents an integer. But it doesn't give us, the, this instance doesn't give us, you know, lots of functionality. We can't add integer instances. We can't subtract integer instances. We, all we can do is create an integer instance and then call a function called is prime. It's just a trivial class. You know, it's, a, it's not something that you would normally see in practice. Normally, you'd see a lot more functions. But, you know, for the exam, I gave a simple class. Uh, so the constructor is, um, the constructor, the job of the constructor is to initialize the member variables. Well, there's only one member variable n. And the constructor takes that n as an argument. So we want to copy from the function argument n into the member variable n. There it is. That's the constructor right there. It's just like the beans constructor. Right? The bean jar constructor. What about is prime? I mean, this is from the lab, so it's pretty much just a regurgitation of the, of the lab. So what about is prime? Now notice is prime doesn't take an argument n. So we don't have to go with this n anymore. We can just use n because there's no naming conflict. We'll just use n this time. So n, member variable n, is n is visible inside this is prime function. It's this n, the member variable n is visible in all the functions. The function argument n for the constructor is only visible in the constructor. This function argument n is not visible in the is prime function. That's the scoping rules. Okay, I'm repeating again. I don't know how many times I said that, but that's that. That's the case. Well, let's let's write the code that returns true when this member variable n is prime. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, so the code that we worked out before, we start at the number two. And uh, sorry, I. And we go up to, but not include the number n, incrementing i. And uh, if if our number n mod i is zero, then we have we know that it has a divisor, so it's not prime. It has a divisor between two and n minus one, inclusive, so it's not prime. But if we finish the loop and we don't find a divisor for n, then we know that it must be prime. We return true. So that's that. <clears throat> now what about, well, is it 9? Oh, we called it extra credit, right? Extra credit. I suppose that there is an integer, suppose the integer class contains a function named prime upper bound. <clears throat> this function returns the smallest prime number that, oh, it returns something. It returns a number. So that means the function is going to look like this. You see? And it's going to be in the integer class. It returns a, a number. It returns a, the smallest something, right? So it, we don't have to read the rest of it to know at that point the, that when we declare the function, we have to declare it as returning an int. You see that piece of information without knowing the other stuff. We know that we have to return an int. All right, and the int is the smallest prime number that's greater than or equal to the member variable n. All right. Well, it doesn't take an argument because it's it doesn't need any more information. It says, "Give me the the smallest prime number that's bigger than or equal to n." And n is already a member variable. It's already n is visible inside the function prime upper bound. All right. Now let's let's think about how how are we going to tackle this problem. Well, you got to have a well, I think you have to have. I had to have. Actually, I haven't done this yet. I graded this when I, I didn't do this solution yet, but I could. It's an easy, easy task. So if, if, if n, let's suppose that n is 8, then, uh, then the, the algorithm should do the following. We should check, we should check, uh, uh, we should check. Uh, we should check if eight is prime, and uh, and it's not. Then we're going to check uh, if nine is prime, and it's not. And then we're going to check. You see, I'm searching upward because we want the smallest prime number that's bigger than or equal to eight. So we're going to start at eight and say, is eight prime? No. Or what about nine? That would be the next possible smallest prime, bigger than or equal to eight. So we just go upward. So you can, do you see the loop here? We have to initialize. There's going to be a number i. We're going to initialize it to eight, and we're going to have a loop, and it's going to increment i each time until we hit a number that's prime, and then that's that's the number. So what about if ten? If ten is prime? No, then we're going to um, check if 11 is prime. Uh, and then we got, we got it, right? That's when we're done. Then we're going to return. We return what? 11. It said return the number. See, that's why it returns an int. Return the, the prime upper bound. I just called it prime upper bound. All right. So we have to have a loop. And we know that we're going to start, I'll use k here, not i. We need to start at n. And we're going to have a loop. And I'm going to start with an infinite loop and just say while true. So just always do this loop. 
So if, if k is prime, return k, else plus plus k. That's what, that's what we did here. If 8 is prime, return 8. Otherwise, increment to the next number. If 9 is prime, it's not. So let's increment to 10. Is 10 prime? It's not. Increment to 11. Is 11 prime? Yeah, 11 is prime. Then we we'll return the value. 11, which is k. So that means we have to get the code here. If k is prime, return k. So it's it's just this code up there. It's um, I'll put it in as a comment here. So for integer i equals 2, i less than k. See, we, we need to know if k is prime. We're going to try all the divisors between 2 and k minus 1. Oh, this is going to be difficult. Plus plus i. Oh, now I can see it's going to be hard for you guys. Right. So what do we do if we find if k mod i is 0? Now, now I see this is where it gets tough. Because you didn't practice this some of these constructs that I'm going to show you. If you found a divisor, then, um, see, like I said, I didn't do this problem yet, so it's going to get sloppy here. Plus plus k, and then continue. Continue means resume from the top of the loop. And continue, reset your eye? what's that? Would continue reset uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I got to reset the eye. Wait a minute. That's not going to work. Yeah, it's not going to work. That's not going to work. Hold on there. It's not going to work. Uh, let's do. Let's do this. Bull found is false. Oh, uh, prime. We'll do this. Prime is true. Prime is false. So if we find a device, so first we'll say k is prime. You know, like this. K, k is prime is false. Is true. We'll start assuming that k is prime. And if we find a divisor, then we change our mind here and set it to false. And uh, we could break. See, you know, I, I could have practiced this problem before I came to lecture today. I didn't want to do that because I wanted you to see me work it out in my head, okay? Because I didn't do this problem yet, although I graded it. <laughs> um, and every, you know, everybody came up with different solution, you know, the people that did it, the ones that got it right. So, uh, so here we, when we break here, we're breaking from the inner loop, by the way. The break breaks the inner loop. So we're back to this while loop here. And uh, so we can't just break. We need to increment k here, oh, which we do right there. This is where we increment k. So when we break from the inner loop, we get to this line, and we increment k. Reset k is prime to true, and then try the for loop again. And uh, but let me go through this loop. We got to see if uh, if we didn't find a divisor, then k is prime will be true. Now, we don't usually say k is prime equal true. We just normally do it like that. If k is prime, if k is prime, then return k. Or do we have to 
<laughs> here? No, because we, when we return, we exit here. You can, if, if you want to put an else there, you can. That's all, that, that works too. If that's easier to read, this is, this is fine as well. A lot of people think that's easier to read. I don't tend to do that, but a lot of people like that that way. No, it wasn't that easy, was it? It's a little, little tricky. And there's many other solutions, by the way, many, many ways to reorganize. This is just what I came up with now on the spot here. Maybe that doesn't work. Did we get it right? We increment k here. I know I got to increment k. I think we're doing it in the right place. We do have to return k. I think this is the right spot. And, um, and by the way, this is this is optional. If you left that out, we would just continue with the loop. We just waste wasting checking additional numbers because we already set k as prime to false. So if we find another divisor, I mean, so what? So we, we break, but we if we didn't break, we would still get the right result. So I think we got it right. I mean, we could test it. We could code it up and test it. But if anybody wants to see that, I'll do it. But we have other things to do. OK. Anyway, that was extra credit. And a couple of people got it. So that's good. Um, Let's jump into arrays now. So actually, arrays and vectors. This is the last chapter of the book that we're going to cover. I think it's, was it chapter five or six? I don't remember. Anybody reading the book? Chapter six. Six, chapter six. Chapter seven is pointers. You know, I would like to teach the class differently. I gotta tell you this. I would like to cover this chapter before classes. And uh, in chapter seven of pointers before classes. That's how I would do it. But you know, we aren't pointers covered in two hundred two. Yeah, they're covered in two hundred two. But I think it'd be better to cover them now and push classes to two hundred two. That's how I would do it. Oh, well, you're just given a little bit of coverage of classes, just the minimal, and uh, then you'll pick it up again in two hundred two. So it has that 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 benefit that you get early exposure to it. <coughs> and next time you see it, maybe it won't be as tough. Uh, but this is the this is the chapter where you really can start working with um, algorithms. You know, arrays are sequences of values. And uh, now that we have we have sequences of values, then we can have operations on those sequences. We can do looping, so we can loop through and look at the elements in, in a list in an array and uh, perform operations. So this is um, kind of the next level of, of algorithms in, uh, in the class. Now look here. Here's an example. My maximum. This is called an array. What's being passed in as the first argument there. It's a sequence of integers. We don't know how big it is. Well, we do. We, the second argument says how many integers are in that sequence. Uh, I want to call it a sequence. We call it an array, but an array is a sequence. So there are number of elements, number of elements in A. Well, and A holds integers. So arrays, they they hold the things that are stored in arrays are all of the same data type, and the data type is you know specified in a normal way, precedes the name of the variable. And you'll see we're also using this thing called a vector. This is a vec This is an array of int a, and this is a vector of int v. Uh, it's an, and it's also a, a reference, but we can skip that for now. V is a vector of int, and a vector and an array they're very similar. Array arrays <laughs> existed in the language called C. And uh, they were a very useful 
and uh, necessary. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, when the language evolved into C++, although C, C language still exists, you can program in it. But when a, when a language called C++ evolved out of C, they added some conveniences. And, um, and one of the conveniences they added were these things called data structures. They're, and a data structure is a way to store uh, multiple pieces of data. You know. and, uh, and a vector is, uh, stores a sequence of items. And then you have things like trees. A tree is a, is a collection of items that are organized in a, in a tree shape. So you start at the top. It's an upside down tree, you know, and then you follow branches and you get to the, the data items on each of the branches. Then you have graphs and uh, you've got heaps and stacks. You've got all these different things. They're called data structures. That's the class that follows 202, by the way. That's, so there's three classes that go in sequence. This class, 202, which focuses mostly on uh, object-oriented programming, and then there's data structures class, which works with data structures. And the, the first data structure is a vector. And a vector is simple. It's just a, a sequence of elements. And it's based on arrays. So arrays and vectors are really the same thing. They just use different, different approaches to operating on them. And we'll, we'll see those differences. But they're essentially the same data structure. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, let's find uh, some example here. Function. Here we go. Let's let's play around with arrays to um, get a better idea how they work. Is it lab six? So there we go. An array is a sequence of values. So let's do that. Let's let's declare an, an array of integers. And here's one way to initialize an array of integers. We'll say the integers will be one, two, six. 11, minus 3, 9. This syntax is not available in older versions of the language, but I believe this is available now. And I'm going to test that here. And that's good. I'm going to test the syntax by compiling. And uh, so now this array has how many elements? 1, 2, 3, four, five, it has six elements. Remember, all the elements must be integers. Let's just declare an integer here. And um, so now we can, we can do things like, let's, let's print out the array. Let's print, let's print the array A. So, and how would we do it? We could do it right here, or we could say, hey, let's, Let's write a function to print all the elements in A. Let's write a function to print all the elements of A. So I'll call the function print. So we declare the array, and then we print the array. So let's go ahead and um, implement print. And print is an array of integer. We need to know the number of elements. I'll call that n. So there's a definition of a function print. It has no return value. It takes an array of int followed by the number of integers in the array. And so we'll, we'll need to pass that value here. What did I say? Six. So this is a stub. It doesn't do anything yet. But we want to we want to try to compile it to see if it 
we uh, got it right, if we got the syntax correct. We did. Let's go. So how do we print each of the elements of A? Well, we'll need a loop. This is our standard loop. Integer i equals 0. i is less than n plus plus i. And then we're going to do C out A of I. Then end in line. Now this array here, this array A, is going to look like the following. I'm just going to show you what I what I visualize when I see this array. There's going to be a position 0, position 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. These are positions. But there's no position 6. See, there's position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. How many positions are there? 6. six. All right, don't be off by 1. And in position 0 is the value 1. In position 1 is the value 2. In position 2 is the value 6. In position 3 is the value 11, and so on. So when you see an array, you have to think this. The, the values in the array are in sequential order. And, they're, and they are given position labels. And the first label is a 0. And the last label is 1 minus the length of the array. This array has length 6. So the final position in the array is 5. And we do it this way because that's how computers think. It's not how people think. We would start with one, wouldn't we? But uh, you know, when when computers were first built, uh, things were done at a very low level. You know, we didn't have languages like this language. This is a higher level language. This this language didn't exist when computers were first built. You know, when they were first built, you had like like these interfaces, like you would think of an LED display, and and and, and connecting wires together to input data and set the state of, of transistors. And I mean, it was really crude and eventually very slowly developed. And, um, and it turned out, based on the, the physical hardware, the way the CPU works, the way memory works, just the way it works in hardware, you know, using electrical signals, that, uh, that you start counting at zero. Just makes sense. I mean, that's how things work. It would be so much more complicated to start at one. It would make the hardware more complicated. And you know that, and the hardware is actually very simple. If you look at an operating system, if you look at a piece of software like a video game, you know, a video game is a lot more complicated than the hardware it runs on. I mean, the hardware is simple. And uh, it's the software that gets enormous and complicated beyond management. But the hardware is a lot. Well, of course, the hardware is complicated as well. But it's not as complicated as, as an operating system or a video game. You can write a video game using very high-level sort of um, uh, tools. But if you dig down and look at all the details the, inside the tools and what's running, it uh, turns out to be very complex. Anyway, coming back, I got off on a tangent. And uh, I wanted to say that there's a reason we start counting from 0. It's because that's how the hardware, that's how it's done in the hardware. So that's just carried over into most languages. Some languages don't do this. Some languages start at 1. I've seen one language called Lua, scripting language using in the gaming industry. And, uh, but that's it. There might be another one, but I don't know what, what it is. Anyway, we start at zero. So when you see an array, you need to think like this. 
And you have to distinguish. These are the values in the array. These values represent positions. And when you're coding, you've got to be um, sharp to always make that distinction. And I'm making a big deal about it now because I know that this is a point of confusion when you start working these problems. So look, AI here, that's an index value. That's a position value like this. But a square bracket i, that's a value. This is, this is the value at position i. That's how you read that, the value at position i. So if i were to be 3, let's suppose i were 3, then a of 3 is 11. <coughs> a of 3 is 11. No, if I were three, yeah, yeah. yeah. which is the fourth position. Yeah. This is the third position. The third position, I'm sorry, this is the fourth position. Listen to this. This is how confusing it is. The fourth position is position three, right? Okay, got it. So A of three is 11. <clears throat> so this should work. Let's see if it works. There we go. All right, now we can do things like um, a function. Make uh, uh, make 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 lucky say. I'm going to do something like this. Maybe this isn't going to work. How do you make an array into a lucky array? Well, let's put, uh, whenever we find a negative number, we'll replace it with a 7. Let's just pretend for now that negative numbers are unlucky, and we have to get rid of them. And we're going to replace them with 7s, because 7 is the lucky number in the United States. Not in other countries. All right. So uh, how do we do that? So replace. We want to replace all negative elements with seven. Replace all negative numbers. See, I'm refactoring. See, I'm, re I'm refactoring the description. I want it to be perfectly clear. Replace all negative numbers in the array A with 7. How do we do that? Huh? Yeah, we've got to have a loop. So I'm just going to copy this loop. Yeah, we have to have a condition. If... A of what? A of i. A of i. Is less, than zero. less than zero. Then do what? A of i equals seven. Yeah, that's it. A of i equals seven. That's it right there. Now watch this. We'll print. We'll print a. And we'll we'll call the function make lucky. And then we'll print again. And uh, I'll just put a new line in there. So we're going to print A. We'll see the A that has a negative value. We'll call our make lucky function to get rid of the negative value, replacing it with a 7. Then we just have a break there so we can see a separation between the two lists. And then we'll print A again. Let's see if that works. There we go. See, negative 3 is second from the end. And we've replaced it with a 7.
So do you guys think you can solve these kind of problems? These aren't too bad, right? This is called linear processing. You, go, you have a linear processing. Basically, you have a, just a single loop, and you operate on these array elements here. How would this look as a, as a vector? This problem, we can restate this problem as a, as a vector problem. I want to show that to you. Is, is the lab today cover vectors? This is due soon, right? Yeah, it's Friday. Yeah. Right. Is that, I better do this. Huh? There's exercises in this lab. All right. OK, let me, let me cover vectors really quickly here. Um, I'll copy main to main two. I need to do this quickly. Let's see. I'm going to use vectors. So, oh, we don't need CMath, by the way. That was a mistake. We need the vector header. This is important. So, to use vectors, you need to include the vector header. And now let's create a vector that has these six elements in it. And I, there might be an easier way to do it, but I don't know. I don't think there is. I think we have to do it uh, the, the brute force way. And the, and the following is the brute force way to do it. We have a vector. And see the syntax, the angle brackets? The data type is, is inside these angle brackets. That, that, that's the type that is stored in the vector, right? And I'm going to call it V, because that's, that's a better mnemonic. So we create the vector V. And then <coughs> we're going to call this function. V, when V is created, it's empty. So V would look like that. It's just an empty list. I'm going to call pushback. This is the function you need to learn. We're going to push back a 1. And when we do that, v now looks like this. So you can't do this with arrays. Arrays are fixed in size. Once you create it, you cannot change the size. Vectors have that flexibility. They can expand to get larger. Let's push back 2. Now v. When we call pushback a second time, now 2 is added to the end of the vector. Now let's push back 6. And uh, 6 is added to the end of the vector. Let's push back 11. 11 is added to the end of the vector. I'm going to get rid of that discontinuity there. Um, let's push back minus 3. We're just making it longer. And finally, 9. Oh, that's a mistake. Looks like that. Now it's the same same deal. You know the array looks like this. I mean the vector looks like it's just like the array. You visualize it in the same way. It's just one difference that we've noted is that the vector is flexible. Its size it can expand to accommodate additional elements that are pushed into it. It can also contract as well. And um, then we print A, we make V lucky, and we print it again. So this would be V, right? Let's go ahead and do this. We've got to do this in five minutes. So how do you print V? Well, we're going to change the syntax here to the vector syntax. So it's a vector of int v. And we don't have to give the size anymore. See, that's another benefit, because the size is available as a member function. 
of the um, vector class. So the n, n is the size. So how do you get the size? It's just v dot size. So v is now, v is an object. It's a, you know, vector. Vector is a class. You know, we've just learned about how to define classes. There's a predefined class that's available in the language called vector. And you create an instance of it like this. And And then you can call member functions. Pushback is a member function. And size is another member function. So let's print. And we hear we use the same syntax, square brackets. Let's do the same down here. Well, I do want to throw in one more thing. V, did we talk about this already? I think we did. I'll talk about it again, and I don't want to get you too confused here. But we're not modifying V. We're only reading from it. So let's pass in a reference and not make a copy of the vector. The vector is large. It's going to be wasteful. So we're going to pass V in as a reference. And uh, we can also declare print. I'm not going to do that now. This is a const, uh, a constant. So we're not modifying v. So we we can tell the compiler that uh, we're not that v is a reference to a constant vector, a vector that we're not going to modify. Make lucky is different. We're going to modify v. So we don't declare it as const, but we have to pass it in as a reference. So we're not modifying a copy of v. And there it is right there. I think that should be that should do it. And uh, you need v of r. V uh, oh yeah, we need v here. Thank you. Yep. Anything else we gotta do? Maybe, but you mean we'll do that for sure. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see, let's see. Print. No matching function for call to print. Oh, because I'm passing in I'm passing in the length. But remember, the vector contains a length value inside of it, so we don't have to pass the length. So we, we took those size arguments out, but we didn't. Now we have to adjust how we call those functions. There it is. Just works nicely. Here's the minus three, second to last slot. We inserted a seven in this place. There it is. That's it. <coughs> so um, we'll see you in lab and uh, or. Uh, Next week.